Welcome to lecture for Psych 501 Research Methods. Uh, we'll be talking about uh, giving some introductory information on behavioral science. Uh, so to begin, we'll talk about what is science. And often, uh, when understand, trying to understand uh, terms and concepts, it's often helpful to, to start with the, the root words, uh, the origins of the words we now use. So we know science comes from uh, the, the Latin root scio, which means to know, right? Uh, or understand. Um, and so science is about knowing and understanding, right? So it's two things really, right? It's uh, knowledge, but it's also a path to that knowledge. So it's a way of knowing things, and then the knowledge that's created by taking that path, that's what science is. And in, in this course, what we're going to focus on uh, is the path Right. It's not kind of science appreciation, kind of what do we know about uh, uh, behavior and psychology, but how do we come to know things about behavior and, and psychology? Um, let's, before we talk about that path, let's let's look at and, and talk a bit about other paths to knowledge, because science isn't the only way to know things. Right? It's it's one way, and it has its advantages. It also has its limitations. Uh, other paths um, that have been used in the past and still are used to, to know things would include intuition, right, which ro uh, involves relying on a subjective sense of what feels right. You know, so uh, artists often use intuition, and they offer kind of their views of knowledge through painting, sculpture, writing, and music. What they they see as truth, their truth. Um, uh, another source of knowledge that um, you would think is is something we is kind of in the past, but still we rely on it very heavily. Uh, is authority, right? So the world's mysteries are knowable through the visions and interpretations of accepted authorities, right? Um, and you think, okay, well, we don't do that anymore. Now everybody kind of uh, thinks and and. and figures things out for themselves. We've moved past those days when people said, oh, the, the earth is flat and everybody's kind of accepted it. Uh, but that's kind of a good example. How do you know the earth is round? Right? Um, and the, the authorities we rely on have changed. Formerly it was frequently uh, uh, the church was the, the source of knowledge, even scientific knowledge. Uh, now it's most often the internet. Right? Well, if Wikipedia says it's true, then it, it's true. Right? That's kind of a new source of uh, authority. And it's one way to get knowledge, but there are certainly problems with relying on what somebody else said without thinking about or figuring it out uh, for yourself. Uh, in some ways, that's where rationalism comes in, right? Which uh, rationalism is an approach where you discover knowledge through logic and rational thought. Right? Uh, theories are used to integrate and organize observed events and thoughts logically. Um, and uh, an original assumption of rationalism was that all knowledge is innate. It can be discovered via logical thought. Uh, an example of using uh, rationalism would be, you know, if if you uh, saw that uh, you knew that Anna is taller than Ben and Ben is taller than Charles, then you can use rational thought to deduce that Anna is taller than Charles. Right? Um, and moving beyond rationalism to uh, empiricism, really, which uh, is a, empiricism was a, a an outright rejection. Uh, of intuition as a source of knowledge and replaced it with personal observation and experience. So the only things you can know are things that you sense. Right? So if you want to know if it's raining, you rely on uh, authority, you turn on the weather channel, you rely on empiricism, you stick your head out the window and see if your face gets wet. Right? Um, so all of these approaches, intuition, authority, rationalism, and empiricism, are used to some extent to advance knowledge. Uh, in the scientific path, which we'll talk more about, is influenced by each of these, but it's, it's different in some ways. It's, it's more object objective, probably, than the first three, uh, and then more systematic than stark empiricism. Right? Science goes beyond simply observing. Right? It's really a combination of empiricism and rationalism. But also, intuition probably plays a role early in the process, and then authority will always uh, influence uh, what's studied in science and how it's studied. Right? We have these kind of uh, rules that we accept as true. Uh, like if you're looking at trying to figure out what kind of measure you want to use for a study, well, you know, it's uh, Cronbach's alpha should be above 0.70 as a measure of liability. And that's something that people in the field generally accept because they learned it in school somewhere and based on authority. So. Authority still is influencing um, this other path. Okay, so before we talk about what the path is, let's talk about some of the the assumptions that that uh, underlie 
a scientific approach to discovering knowledge. Uh, one is the assumption of order, right? That there's some sort of pattern behind the chaos, right? That events in the world are orderly and predictable. That things do not occur randomly, right? If you heat water to a precise temperature, it boils. Uh, if there were no patterns, if, it, if things weren't systematic, then there would be no, no science. There would be no point in having science. Um, related to that is the, the assumption of determinism, right? That every event has a cause, uh, and the antecedents uh, of an event completely explain it. Right? So kind of everything happens for a reason. And you might not be able to uh, know them immediately, but they are discoverable. And they, they're certainly um, something caused everything to happen, right? And that, that's uh, a huge uh, assumption, which related to order. So not only things are, are, are uh, in order, in their, their, their patterns, but their cause and effect patterns. And nothing happens in and of itself. And things that weren't uh, caused can't be studied by science. Uh, that's why one argument um, about the, the, the kind of the, where uh, science and religion um, struggle to understand each other is, well, if God wasn't made, wasn't caused by something else, then science can't study God. So it's not an appropriate subject for science. doesn't mean it's not something that can be uh, known or you can't develop knowledge about it, but you can't use science to, to gather knowledge about that because it doesn't fit with the assumptions of science. Right? So science is only good for some questions, things that uh, um, are consistent with its assumptions. Uh, another big assumption is uh, one uh, that parsimony is best. <coughs> Excuse me. So this is when, uh, if all else is equal, the simpler of two explanations is the best. Right? You often hear about this referred to as Occam's razor. It's not that the simplest explanation is the best. It's the of the best explanations. If there's two or two or three or four that are all equally good explanations. They all explain with equal power. The simpler one, the simplest one of those, is the best. Right? So not, it's not just being simple, but simplest of the best. That's what parsimony is about. Uh, uh, another uh, assumption uh, and key feature of science uh, is replication. Right? So if um, uh, whenever we, we conduct science and we know something, it's not something, okay, you found it, it's true, we're good. There's always the, this kind of uh, skepticism in the back of my mind to say, well, you found it once. And we have mathematical ways of estimating how likely it is that, that what you found was due to chance. But usually that, that estimation is not zero. So it c you could have found it by chance. So find it again. Somebody else needs to find it again. Right? So if you find something, can you find it again? Can someone else find it? Right? Uh, and that's why there's a, uh, uh, when you publish your findings, you always have to publish your, your method. You have to say how you came to find it. That way people can say, okay, well, um, I didn't find that. How do we do things differently? Or if I did it exactly the same way and we found different things, you know, what does that mean? And this keeps science from being, being, uh, uh, becoming a source of just unquestioned uh, authority for knowledge, right? Because if we, people didn't publish their methods, then science is, is no longer this different path. It's just another mechanism of authority of people saying, this is what I found. If you say how you found it, now it's not just relying on authority because you can go back and, and do it again yourself. Right. Uh, and implicit in this requirement for a replication is a recognition that the, the tools of our science are imperfect. Right? We might make an errant conclusion in one study or maybe more than one study. But once the results of multiple studies begin to converge uh, in support of a theory or hypothesis, then confidence increases. Which brings me to uh, the last point about assumptions of science is the impossibility of proof or disproof. Right? We can, especially in, the, uh, in our behavioral science, we can never um, fully prove or disprove anything with a single study. Right? Um, in any given study, you're dealing with some, uh, some portion of the population. Right? Uh, and the assumption is that we can use statistics to help us estimate the probability that something is true about some broader population from which our sample was drawn. Right? But this probability will never be 1.0, it will never be 100%. Even if some fact were true, so if even it were true that um, if you make people angry enough, or if you make people uh, uh, really angry, they'll hit someone, there will always be someone that doesn't do it uh, in your study, or some, some exception, there's almost always an exception to every rule about people. Right? Um, 
And if there's someone out there in the planet that won't hit anybody, even when they're really mad, then what I found in my sample, even if I have a million people in my sample, it's not true of the population. It's not, it's not this completely generalizable rule. It's pretty generalizable, but not true of everybody. Um, so I can't say that I proved that this is true for everyone. I say, well, it, it happens in a lot of people. But that's, that's just short of proving these kind of uh, general rules. Uh, similarly, there's an impossibility of disproof, right? Just because we didn't find something to be true in our sample doesn't mean that it's not true in some other people or in the population in general. Maybe I just didn't do a good enough job designing my study, didn't provide an accurate test of the question. Um, so we can never um, uh, completely prove or disprove anything with a single study. These studies accumulate to contribute to evidence that something is true, or they can deteriorate, take away evidence, take away evidence that something that was formerly believed to be true, say, well, now we're not so sure that that's true anymore. Uh, okay, so now let's, let's get on to uh, the path, right? So what are the steps in the scientific method? Right? It starts quite simply with observation, right, which we get from empiricism. You notice something in the world, and you begin to wonder if it might be true in more than the instance or instances you observed, right? And probably using some intuition here, right? An uh, example might be, uh, you know, the couple in the apartment next to yours argues a lot, and you notice that they seem to fight more frequently, more loudly, in the week right before a major holiday. Maybe this is true for other couples too, right? So I'm starting to get some ideas of a research question, right? So you observe some phenomena, you begin formulating questions in your mind, um, and then you review existing theories, right? You read articles and books, you think about what you've learned to gather information on what's known or thought about uh, the patterns related to your observation, right? So in this example, uh, what do we know about patterns of, of couple conflict, right? Uh, and this is done for uh, a couple of reasons. Um, one, it helps you, uh, if you don't have a clear research question, helps you research question helps you formulate your research question and if you have one well I kind of think there's something about these couples and the timing it helps you refine it right and uh, you get a better idea of the question you want to ask uh, and the, the kind of answers you might be uh, looking for and the other reason you go to theory you don't just go ob observe something and go, okay well, let's go do a test and this is a big reason that science is additive uh, in nature you don't want to start from scratch every time. You always want to see, well, what do, what have people found before me? What are people thinking? Because I want to build on what we know. And it's not that I have to go and uh, say, okay, well, they found this, they must be right, so I've got to fit it in here. But if they found, you know, something, I've got to f figure out where my question is either going to, okay, would my question support that or, or would it run counter to it? But I've got to compare it to it. Otherwise, the existing knowledge and theories will be static and they'll be stuck. Right? And that's not what science is about. Science is about moving forward. So you've got to figure out where your question is, is in relation to what's known so that when you have results, you can figure out, okay, do, does my study add to and, and kind of corroborate what was thought before I did my study? Or does it point to some questions that, okay, maybe that's not right uh, for everybody or not right all the time or not right in all situations. Right? So you always go to the literature and see what's, what's there. And uh, ideally, you'll find, uh, if not uh, some kind of clear uh, empirical uh, uh, arrows pointing you to what to expect, some theoretical ones. So, okay, well, given this particular theory about how couples interact and what kind of things cause conflict in relationships, then uh, this thing might be true. Right? Which is then where you go to um, deriving a hypothesis from your theory. Um, and if uh, and that's what most of us do if you're um, someone pretty special you might also develop your own theory but even if you develop your own theory you have to have some account for how it differs from and how it um, uh, accounts for things that existing theories uh, can already explain right? we can't just add new theories and not relate them to existing ones otherwise science doesn't move forward it moves sideways Right? So if you think something else is wrong, you have to kind of be able to explain why yours is right and why the other one is wrong, why yours is a better model. Okay? But generally, uh, we, we, if we don't come up with new theories. 
most of us, there's a, a small percentage of people that are able to do that. Most of us look at existing theories and, and find different facets of those things that haven't been fully investigated yet. Um, and you derive a hypothesis. An hypothesis is simply uh, a kind of a statement um, expected r about an expected relationship between or among variables, usually, or it could be about the nature of variables. Right, so uh, most often it's about relationships among variables. Sometimes nature, like sometimes you might, um, uh, this is for people to do kind of high order uh, stat stuff. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, example might be uh, thinking about sadness and depression. And the question is, are those uh, quantitatively different expressions of a continuous construct? So depression is and sadness are the same, depression is just more of this kind of negative affect, negative emotion? Or are they uh, better uh, understood in, in reality? Are they really qualitatively different constructs? So that um, you can be high or low in sadness and high or low in depression, and they're not necessarily uh, the same thing. Right? And that is that could be a research question. You could have the hypothesis, and you could test that using uh, kind of cluster analysis, other kind of um, uh, really interesting statistical techniques. But most of the time, we'll be looking at relationships between and among variables, uh, either uh, cause and effect relationships, or just are they uh, associated? Are they related? Uh, so before I go uh, I any further, let's just talk for a second about, well, and most of you know this, I know, but I'm just going to, for those who uh, aren't as uh, familiar with some of the, these terms, what is a variable? Right, so a variable, as the name implies, is anything that can vary, anything that can take on different values. Right? Uh, as opposed to a constant. A constant cannot have different values, it has one value. So temperature is a variable. Right? It can, you can be different temperatures. But the temperature at which water boils at sea level is a constant. Right? So at sea level, water boils at one temperature and one temperature only. Okay? <laughs> but again, you, you notice I have to say at sea level, because if I just say the temperature at which water boils, well, that's actually a variable. Water boils at different temperatures depending on your altitude. Um, so it's it's pretty hard to come up with uh, examples of things that aren't variables. There are very few uh, um, constants unless we get to very kind of specific, right? So if I say you know hair color is variable, and you say, well, I don't I don't dye my hair; it's constant. Yeah, but I didn't say your hair color. Your hair color may be a constant. Probably not. Most of us age, and it changes. But your hair color today <laughs> is a constant. Right? If I start drawing these boxes, get very specific, it's a constant. But most things can take on different values, uh, including uh, hair color. Okay. And hypotheses are about some variables. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, okay, so for our, our example with the couples, um, uh, hypothesis might be, uh, well, maybe, maybe they fight uh, uh, more uh, before the holidays because they, and, and other couples, again, uh, argue about how or where to spend the holidays. Right? Maybe it's something about that. And I'm starting start thinking, okay, maybe it has to do with uh, family of origin issues and uh, that they haven't yet uh, uh, formed their own uh, uh, system of, uh, uh, of holidays and rituals and, and customs within this new unit. Right? There's all kinds of things you can start thinking about it to explain these observations. Right? Uh, and then you take your hypothesis further and you develop uh, a testable, testable uh, prediction based on your hypothesis. So if your hypo hypothesis was true, so uh, uh, what would you see? What would you observe in a particular <coughs> situation? Uh, for example, if, if I, my hypothesis was really kind of simple, I said, well, I think, uh, I think I see this pattern, and I think that um, couples fight more before holidays. I don't even get to why. I'm just saying, I think it, it's something, something about the holidays. My next thing would be about why. Um, well, now I've got to figure out how to uh, observe that. So uh, if that's true, so if couples fight more before holidays, then, you have to remember those if-then statements, if this relationship is true, then uh, the number of 911 calls regarding partner violence will be higher in the week before a major holiday than in the week following a major holiday. Right? That's something that follows logically from, okay, if I'm right about this, what's something I could see, observe in the world somewhere that exists already or that I could create in a, in a lab, but something that I could tangibly see that would, uh, if it's true, then it's consistent with my uh, hypothesis, and if it's not true, then my hypothesis uh, would be wrong. Right? Uh, so a couple things about that. It has to be, like I said, uh, testable. 
um, which usually means that the, vari the variables need to be measurable. Um, so, um, if, you know, I had some of us about, well, you know, if your chakras are aligned, you will have good health. Well, I can measure health, and I can operationally define good health, but I cannot ob ob objectively measure chakra alignment, right? That's kind of thinking about these energies which can only be read by people and can't be read by uh, any kind of uh, instruments. That wouldn't be a testable hypothesis. No, that's not a question that science can look at. You know, I'm not saying that it's wrong or that it's right. It just can't be evaluated um, scientifically. Uh, so uh, it helps that the var variables are measurable to be testable. Uh, it also needs to be, the hypothesis needs to be falsifiable, right? So uh, it needs to be possible to be wrong, right? Um, and you, well, most things can be wrong, right? Well, it depends on how you word it. Like if I say, uh, my hypothesis is that uh, people can heal their wounds if they concentrate hard enough. Right? See, what I'll have to do is if my hypothesis isn't, uh, if the data aren't consistent with my hypothesis, then I say, well, uh, they didn't heal, but it's because they didn't concentrate hard enough. right? Because I built that into my hypothesis, so therefore it's not falsifiable. I can never be proven wrong. Because I can always say, well, they didn't do it uh, enough. There wasn't enough of this thing. So it has to be things that are in kind of clear terms where it's possible to observe the opposite of what you expect to be true. Okay. Um, and, and then last, uh, it should be uh, stated in, in the positive. Um, so you need to, for hypothesis, you need to state the presence of a relationship, not the absence of one. Um, and this is largely because of the way we test hypotheses uh, uh, currently using something we'll talk more about later, null hypothesis statistical testing, NHST. Um, because using NHST, null hypothesis statistical testing, um, uh, significance testing, sorry, uh, we go in with the assumption that there's no relationship and then calculate the probability that this lack of relationship is true. Uh, and if it's highly unlikely that there's not a relationship between two variables, then we conclude that there probably is a relationship, which is very backwards and convoluted. Uh, but that's the nature of our uh, our data analysis, which again we'll talk more about later. But basically, you 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 have to s go in expecting uh, two things to be related. You can, you can't try to prove two things are unrelated because, at least using uh, traditional statistics, uh, it it won't it won't work. So if you really do believe that two variables are not related, but other people have shown that they are, then you need to uh, identify typically identify a third variable that's related to one of the other two. Right, so if you think that watching TV is is not related to uh, kids' scores on the the, the tax test, uh, toss test, whatever they're taking now, uh, you would design a study looking at some other predictor of those scores, maybe study time, whatever, and then you can show that study time is a better predictor than TV watching. Right, so now you can't go in saying I don't think these things are related, but you have to come up with something that is more related or a better predictor, and that kind of will still serve that that same purpose if you think some some relationship that's been purported is is incorrect. Okay, so we come up with a testable prediction, uh, and then we, we, we test it, right? And it's a systematic test of the prediction. It's not just, oh, well, uh, let's see. It's uh, very, uh, if it's done well, uh, rigorous, uh, and you account for all these other um, things that might influence uh, the results, right? This is where all the research methods are applied. Uh, and the key here is a systematic method that tries to eliminate bias or chaos uh, error variance from contaminating your test and we can't ever eliminate those things completely we try to limit them um, so that we can be as confident in our answer uh, that we get from collecting uh, data as possible uh, it's important to note here that um, science is is often more objective than uh, other past knowledge but it is not 100 percent objective right? the the choice of what study the choice of how it studied all these things are made by people and people are not 100% objective. They're, they're just not. So there is some subjectivity in there, but we try to limit it as best we can uh, with our methods, and we make our methods open to others so that they can see, and if they see some sort of bias that we're not even aware of, they can pick it out and say, okay, well, you found this, but it's because of the way you measured it, and that's not accurate, you know. Uh, that reflects your own kind of uh, cultural biases, personal biases, expectations, uh, whatever. And so there, there's many, many decisions you're going to be making uh, uh, when figuring out how to design a test. And that's what this class is, is here to teach you about what to think about when making those decisions, not what decisions to make. That's up to you as the, the designer of research. But 
what kind of uh, things do you have to choose from? Uh, one of the decisions you have to make, we won't talk about all of them here, but one an important one is um, how you will operationally define your variables, right? creating operational definitions. Um, because usually we're interested in constructs, right? uh, ideas, um, things that can't be observed directly. Depression, aggression, creativity. You can't see those, weigh those. You can't uh, measure those using kind of physical sciences. Right? But they're important and they're interesting. So what we have to do is measure some, some marker, some indicator that we think uh, indicates the presence or absence uh, of that construct. Uh, for example, for aggression, uh, many different thoughts about what aggression, what constitutes uh, aggression. Uh, maybe you want to operationalize aggression as uh, physical contact during an interpersonal dispute. Right? Or you may operationalize it as verbal, uh, uh, loud verbal exchanges. It, there are many different ways to operationalize it, but you have to decide, in this study, when I say aggression, I mean this. So two studies looking at aggression can find different things, and it, what they find might depend on how the variable is operationalized, and you make that very clear. Um, and then you have other decisions, including the research design, how the variables will be measured and manipulated. Um, uh, so, you know, if I'm going to do uh, physical contact uh, between people, this, I still haven't decided how to measure that. Like, uh, am I going to use, uh, am I going to videotape people and have people watch and count the number of times? Uh, will I put paint on their hands and see see how much paint's on the other person's clothes. There are lots of different ways to, to, to measure something, even when you get down to an operational definition. So you have to get even more specific to exactly how you're going to do it. Uh, decide who's going to be in the study, that's the sample, then the procedure, everything that uh, is going to be done to or done by anybody uh, that's a participant uh, in the study. Uh, and then how you're going to, to analyze the data, which is the next step. So after you've uh, designed the study, which takes a lot of work, uh, and you conduct the study, it, when you do that, it generates uh, data, right? which, side note here, data is a plural word. Right? So uh, don't say um, a data. right? They are data. Uh, you generate data, uh, and you analyze that data and to, to find out if you... Uh, supported or con constructed your hypothesis, right? So in your study, you find something that two groups were different, two groups were the same, submitted something more than the other, and you always relate it back to your original prediction. So, well, what did I predict? And did it, were my results consistent with or contrary to my predictions? Right? And then uh, you don't stop there, right? Because again, this isn't just about one study and one hypothesis. Given either if my hypothesis was supported or contradicted, what does that say about the theory from which I derived my hypothesis? And usually it involves some revision of the theory. We're going to add some, maybe not a complete revision, but we're going to add some little piece to it. Okay, the theory says this will happen between uh, this group and this group, but really it's only when uh, this other variable is present. Or uh, it's only for people of uh, this age or people with these experiences. Right? We can always, we're adding some little bit to the original theory. And it's still kind of tentative if we're the only ones that have found it. And then if people find it too, then revisions to the theory become more uh, uh, acceptable. Uh, and then we're, we're still not done. Well, you may be done with that study, but now that you revised uh, uh, the theory, you derive new hypotheses or a new hypothesis from the revised theory. So it's this never-ending process uh, So where each result uh, of a study typically leads to new questions. And, and knowledge slowly builds and is refined. And if we do it well, uh, and if we use rigorous methods, and we're, we're open about what we do so people can kind of uh, criticize and learn from uh, us and from each other, we get closer to the truth about people, which is uh, something that's really hard uh, to nail down and probably something that changes over time. People today are probably different than people um, 20 years ago maybe even 10 years ago. Right? Uh, the way the world works uh, pre-9-11, post-9-11, very different. So a lot of the things we, we learned from science, even though we got really close to the truth about people at that point in time, some of those things are still true, and some of them are about, are, are about the fundamental nature of humanity. But a lot of stuff doesn't seem to be too fundamental. So a lot of what we know continues to change. Um, so if you ever uh, want a job that's always going to be uh, in demand, Become a researcher, right? Always, always something new to learn. Okay, um, 
So we've talked about the path. Now let's talk about it uh, directly uh, with regards to psychology. Uh, as you notice, the title of the lecture is uh, Introduction to Behavioral Science, uh, and that reflects an emphasis on observable behavior, which is uh, the result of a shift in the field. It's, it's decades old now, but you know I don't t don't talk about a psychological science. We, we say behavioral science, uh, and this is because there was a shift toward examining observable phenomenon. Right? We, we can still investigate things that aren't observable like love, because those are the things that are interesting. But there's an acknowledgement that we can only study what we presume to be objective indicators of unobservable phenomena. So we always say, okay, I'm trying to look at um, how love changes across the lifespan, and here's how I define love. There's always that operational definition that says, I'm not saying that I know exactly how it works, but based on this understanding of, of love, this is what happens. And then people can argue about how to best define love and how uh, results might differ depending on how you would operationalize a, a variable. But we always are grounded in, in that uh, uh, things that are uh, observable, which is different from where we started with uh, uh, with Wundt's work with the first psych laboratory, where it was you know just introspection, where he would have them you know look at a, a, a stimulus, you know a light, and then go inward in, in, in their own experience and talk about what they perceived. And we would analyze that. And you can't observe what they perceive. You, they would have to tell you. And we're moving away from that to more uh, observable phenomenon. Um, okay, so what, uh, what do we do with this science uh, of behaviors, behavioral science, science of psychology? Well, a lot of things. And depends on your goals. Uh, and an acronym, acronym for, uh, um, uh, to help remember this would be uh, DOOPSY or initialism, I guess it would be, uh, stands for uh, the goals. One, you might be to describe uh, behavior, the most basic scientific goal, right? Scientific description differs, though, from the everyday version, right? It tries to be uh, objective and free from personal bias. Again, tries. Um, for example, um, uh, non-scientific would be uh, you can't trust a drug addict, right? That's a description of human experience. Uh, versus uh, a scientific statement would be 80% uh, of individuals diagnosed with substance dependence acknowledge that they have lied about their substance abuse. Right? And that uh, scientific description, you could from that conclude that you can't trust a drug, drug addict, but that's it's rationalism, and that's one way to come up with that knowledge, but that conclusion isn't necessarily justified by the scientific description, right? which is where people usually get in trouble. Science tries to state things in terms of facts, and then we take those facts and jump from them to other uh, conclusions. Uh, but science in general will try not to jump to those conclusions, but stay at the, 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 the fact level, at least when we're reporting uh, results. Uh, so you might want to be just to describing phenomenon, how many, of, uh, peop how many people do this thing, who does this thing, and who doesn't do this other thing, right? which is a, a laudable goal. Uh, frequently, our goal is to try to understand uh, behavior. Try, tr usually, this involves trying to identify causal relationships. You know, why did this happen this way at this time with this person? Right? Why didn't people help someone in need when there was a big crowd? Right? Think about the uh, from if you took social psych already, um, diffusion responsibility studies. Right. So try to understand why people do the things they do and why they don't do some things that it seems like they should do. That's uh, another important goal. Um, that uh, uh, science may, may, may look at. Uh, and then prediction, right? So if A, then B. So, um, and this is one of the more uh, marketable uses of psychological science. So, you know, who's going to be a success or a failure? So if I get 20 job applicants for this position uh, as a manager in the company, how can I know which one is going to be a good manager and which one's going to uh, be a flop, right? And so they give them personality tests and they, they figure stuff out about who's going to be better than who else. And they do that based on scientific research that's tried to figure out what separates successful from unsuccessful people, right? Um, in the clinical world, try to figure out which clients are more likely to um, commit suicide uh, successfully uh, among all the people uh, you'll see, right? So trying to predict behavior, a uh, hugely important goal. Uh, another one, uh, often people don't like the way it's phrased, but uh, control. Uh, another word might be influence, so control or influence behavior, and not necessarily in the kind of big brother kind of way of we will control you, which is a possibility. Psychological science, behavioral science could be misused 
to control people's behavior and probably is to a large degree by uh, advertising agencies. They try to influence your behavior and they do it based largely on behavioral science, trying to figure out what things will people pay attention to, uh, how to get a message uh, across, you know, how to distract people enough with one thing to slide in some other message. Um, but it can also be used uh, for the good. You know, how do we reduce um, uh, smoking behaviors uh, or violent behaviors? So how do we keep people from harming themselves and harming others, right? Uh, so therapy is all about uh, the science behind how do we make people uh, uh, behave, think differently, and make or get, depends on y your perspective. Um, but a variety of behaviors beyond that also on to, you know, how could uh, the government encourage people to uh, save more money? How could they encourage people to spend more money? Which I guarantee you they're interested in those questions. Uh, and those are things that behavioral science um, can do if done well. So uh, potential for a, a, lot of, a lot of power here. There's a lot of things that can be done um, with behavioral science. Which brings me to why it matters to you. Why, why should you be taking this course and learning things? Uh, one Hopefully it will, will help you uh, in your, your critical thinking. You've already got some critical thinking skills. Um, this will hopefully uh, hone those and sharpen them. It's a good place to, to do that. Uh, you know, we're bombarded uh, daily with uh, um, uh, internet, newspaper, magazine uh, stories that uh, report and draw conclusions from research results. Oh, a new study came out that said blah, blah. And then, you know, there's one little blip about the study and then they go off on uh, this long tangent about how people should be or what you should do, right? What kind of car you should drive or what kind of uh, parent you should be, right? Um, a good background in research methods can help you evaluate these claims critically, right? You can go back and find the, you know, you, can, you will know where to find the original research article, which isn't usually published in the newspaper or on the internet. You'll be able to track that down. You'll be able to look at their methodology and then decide for yourself if the results of the study, one, are, are uh, valid if the study was done well and it makes sense, and two, are the claims these people are making consistent with the way the study was uh, uh, conducted? Because frequently, too frequently, uh, people will, will uh, publish correlational studies to find an association between one variable and another, and that's fine, that's good science, and they'll say in their research paper that these two things are associated, and then it'll get picked up in the popular media as this variable causes this variable, which is possible, but it's not what that study said, and it's not what the study was intended to say. Uh, and again, if you're a, a good consumer of research and a critical thinker, you'll be able to pick those things apart and say, well, maybe, or there could be this other explanation. We can't know based on this one study. We'd have to look at some other studies or do some more studies. Uh, in addition to that, uh, probably will help in your professional life, being able to understand uh, research relevant to many professions. Obviously, if you're going into the mental health profession, uh, you need to be able to read research and make decisions uh, about uh, treatment, facilities, medications, testing procedures, um, rather than just doing you know, what you learned in school now. Because the right thing to do with a particular patient will change. The standards uh, of our profession are in flux. As new information comes out, things that used to, we used to think, okay, well, that was okay to do. Now we think, wow, that's, that's not really uh, effective, or it's not efficient, or there's a better way to do it. And if you're sticking to what you learned in school 20 years later, you're going to be guilty of malpractice, and you're, you're probably causing harm to your clients. Right? So you have to be able to keep up with, uh, with the latest findings. And, and uh, at a, from a uh, broader level, Behavioral science provides a foundation for what you do, right? It makes the difference between a mental health professional and a mystic. Uh, I'm not saying that a, a mystic or, you know, a shaman or uh, whatever, that they're wrong, but they're not you. They're not a licensed mental health professional, right? They may help people. They may not. That's debatable. But if you're granted uh, authority, usually by a state, to, to practice as a mental health professional, it's based on the assumption that you're working within this, uh, um, this realm of behavioral science and that what you do is based on what's known, what's become known from this path of, on this path of knowledge and not on 
uh, just what's been handed down uh, culturally or what you feel is the right thing to do with your clients. Well, it seems to me it'd be good to slap my clients if they get really angry. That would probably calm them down. You know, if there's not a study that says it's okay to slap your clients or it's helpful to slap your clients, don't do it. Right? So you are grounded in the science. Uh, in other fields, uh, educators. You know, uh, the effectiveness of teaching strategies uh, is changing because the student populations are always changing. Uh, most recently, push the past 20 years has probably been the emphasis on uh, technology, right? Uh, so teachers uh, need to be able to keep up with uh, uh, the latest trends uh, in research. And that's a, probably a new push for a lot of educators uh, is uh, um, the push for relying on uh, empirically based or empirically validated approaches to teaching, um, which is probably a good thing. Uh, and then in business, of course, they rely on research to make decisions about marketing strategies, uh, improving, um, improving employee morale, uh, ways to select and train employees. Um, so in many, many walks of life, what we know from behavioral science is used, the knowledge is used. And then the methods are also often used. Right? Um, some of the best methodologists for designing a study, any type of study, come from behavioral science programs, right? Experimental psych um, People with experimental psych degrees, they're often called upon, okay, we need to do a study to figure out, you know, uh, which of these uh, um, engines is going to run better. It has nothing to do with behavior, but they're very good methodologists. That's kind of one thing that uh, behavioral sciences have long prided themselves on, is being good at being able to ask these questions systematically. Right? Uh, and because of that, our methods uh, are used in a variety of fields. Okay, related to that, important decisions are made based on research. Right? Uh, scientific research is becoming increasingly important in shaping uh, public policy. Right? Legislators and political leaders at all levels are taking positions uh, based on research findings, or at least they're, <laughs> they're taking positions for whatever reasons, and then they're justifying their positions based on research findings. Right? To be an informed uh, citizen, to be a, a responsible member of a democracy, you need to understand the research that they're that they're claiming supports their position and be able to determine does the research really support their position or not right and hugely important things uh, have um, been decided with the help of behavioral scientists so uh, uh, Brown versus Board of Education right um, the the decision that banned uh, um, uh, segregation the APA filed uh, a, a amicus brief a brief to the Supreme Court to help with that decision to say that you know uh, it's uh, there's science to show that um, desegregation is a good thing and segregation is, is a bad thing right uh, the Surgeon General's uh, report on on smoking right that's an example of of science changing policy um, so uh, it's important to know what the science says and if it says what people say it says. You know, often people say, oh, you can make statistics say anything. Yes and no. Uh, if you don't know about research methods, people can misuse science to, to support their claims. But if you know how to read it, you can, they can't, uh, it's not magic. They can't uh, make things up out of thin air. If you know how to read things if you, and you can uh, evaluate research, you can tell if what they're saying is justified, supported by, a particular study or, or group of studies. Um, and if you, if you blissfully float along in ignorance and accept whatever scientific data are offered as proof of people's claims, then uh, uh, enjoy and, and hope that things go well for you. Uh, but for me, uh, I'd rather um, look around and have some idea of what's going on. Uh, even if you can't uh, control the decisions, you can at least know what's, what's coming. Okay. Uh, the last thing of why it should should matter to you, you might want to do research yourself, uh, right? And research isn't it isn't the province of a bunch of super nerds and lab coats, right? Anyone can get involved. It just requires a certain disposition. One, you you need to be um, capable of a certain level of of skepticism to be able to go in doubting. Okay, you say this is true. Interesting. It might be. Show me. Right? And that's the attitude uh, of scientists. The scientists aren't like, no, that's wrong, but they're like, hmm, maybe, let's see. They don't accept things uh, on authority. Um, they, they try not to. Uh, and then that's balanced with also an, an, oh, a sense of uh, open-mindedness that, okay, uh, you say that's true. It might be. I don't know. Show me. I wonder what else might be true. 
right? So uh, even being being open to things that run counter to your own interests. So if you're uh, you know a clinical researcher, um, when you're studying to see if your work is effective, you want to be open to. Maybe, maybe what I'm doing is not effective. Why might what I'm doing not be effective? How could I show that I'm not that the particular procedure I'm using isn't effective? Right? You can't just be kind of self-serving and only look for confirming what you expect. You really have to be able to look at, okay, what would disconfirm what I expect, and be able to consider all these different uh, possibilities. Uh, helpful with that is is a creative disposition, being able to think uh, differently. Because if you just kind of toe the line and, and go with what's known, you're not going to add much uh, to science. You might be really good at cranking out numbers and doing statistics, but in terms of research design and thinking of uh, research questions that are interesting, it really takes a, a pretty high level of, of creativity. Uh, and then the last characteristic uh, that's important would be uh, to be uh, collaborative. Science isn't something that's done. Uh, uh, by individuals, right? Often these individual names uh, emerge in the history of science. You know, we have you know our Niels Bohr and Albert Einstein and uh, Marie Curie uh, and these people, but almost always um, the the findings, uh, the significant findings, come through through collaborative effort, efforts. There may be some people that are uh, brilliant theorists that advance ideas, but even they usually are in discussions with other people. So uh, you have to be able to uh, work well with others. Um, because it's all about sharing information and learning from from uh, each other. Okay, so uh, summing up, uh, key things uh, uh, to know: uh, behavior science is a path to acquiring knowledge uh, 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 about behavior. But again, it's it's a path, not the path. It's not the only way to know things. If you want to know, uh, should you spank your kids or not? You can look at the research uh, on the effects of spanking, and I think you should. I think that should inform your decision, but should you make your decision based on that? Personally, I don't think so. I think you should you should think about that. You should think about your own uh, cultural, religious values. Um, think about your own experiences and uh, what you think works for you, and make a decision based on all that accumulated information. Right, and remember that science is a source, uh, an important source, one that's probably too often neglected, uh, neglected source, we prefer to rely on uh, authority and intuition, but it's not the only source, not the only path. Okay. Uh, and uh, the key characteristics of our science, there's really an emphasis on uh, a systematic approach aimed at lessening the impact of bias on building knowledge, and not eliminating it, but lessening uh, the impact um, uh, closer to the truth type of truth than uh, some other uh, paths. Uh, and then it's important primarily because the knowledge generated uh, by science and behavioral science can be used, is used, to influence really important decisions. Uh, and if you care what happens to you and want to know why things are happening to you and possibly be able to influence what happens to you, it's probably a good idea to, to figure out um, how some of this science stuff uh, is being done. Okay, that's all for now. Take care.